Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you John Garfield, Jeffrey Lynn, and Priscilla, Rosemary, Lola, and Leota Lane in Four Daughters. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight in our play, Four Daughters, we take you into an American home, one where the overwhelming problem of bringing up a daughter is multiplied four times. Add the fact that all four daughters are of marriageable age, and we get, to say the least, a very busy telephone. It's popularly supposed that in such a household, the first girl up is the best girl dressed. But thanks to our product, Lux Flakes, one budget can cover four wardrobes quite gracefully. In fact, it's it's little feminine miracles like this that Lux Flakes thrives on. Our family tonight could be your own family, if you have the necessary number of daughters, because it's the gaiety, courage, and affairs of the heart of four daughters that are vital to this drama. On the screen, the Warner Brothers production enjoyed such popularity that a sequel called Four Wives will soon be released. Tonight, in our adaptation of Four Daughters, we have John Garfield, Jeffrey Lynn, and Priscilla, Rosemary, and Lola Lane from the original cast. And we have an unexpected Lane as the fourth daughter. You've seen Priscilla, Rosemary, and Lola in many motion pictures. Leota Lane has appeared in New York musical comedies and recently has been studying for Grand Opera. When we heard that she was visiting her mother and sisters here in Hollywood, we leapt at the opportunity to cast four sisters as four daughters. Besides having four members of one family, we have another unusual statistic tonight. Five of our stars are newcomers to the Lux Radio Theater. John Garfield makes his first appearance at our microphone in the role which gained him screen stardom. You'll hear him as, as Mickey Borden, the embittered composer who somehow contrives to make cynicism a lovable quality. Jeffrey Lynn, another young man whose career received powerful impetus from Four Daughters, will play Felix, his original role. Mr. Lynn is the only one of our stars tonight who knew exactly where to find our stage door. And, let me add, no grass has had a chance to grow in front of that door this week, with so many stars beating a path to our microphone. Now we raise the curtain on Act One of Four Daughters, starring John Garfield as Mickey, Jeffrey Lynn as Felix, Priscilla Lane as Anne, Rosemary Lane as Emma, Lola Lane as Thea, and Leota Lane as Kay. In the living room of a comfortable home on Long Island, Adam Kemp, teacher of music and the proud father of four grown daughters, listens with a critical ear to their rendition of Schubert's Serenade. At the harp is Emma, oldest of the four sisters, and by far the most serious. At the cello, Thea lends grace and charm to the ensemble. The voice you hear is Kay. Kay is the really talented member of the family and the most ambitious. But the liveliest, prettiest, and youngest of the four is Anne. No, no, no. Stop, stop. What's the matter, Dad? Why, your playing is awful. It's horrible. It has no soul. How can four such beautiful girls make four such horrible sounds? <laughs> well, anyhow, Dad, you admit we're beautiful. Beauty isn't enough to justify itself, Anne, unless you do something to go with it. Oh, how I wish I had a lot of money so I could cut all four of you off without a cent. We're safe. No dean of a music school ever got rich. Say, Dad, why don't you go in for more sweepstake tickets? Quite typical, Thea. Something for nothing. That's what you want, isn't it? Darling, you can't be mad just because we didn't turn out to be four little genii. You seem to forget that there is one genius in the family. If you're referring to Kay's voice, Anne, it's just an ordinary voice that needs years of hard work and Dad, training. Dad, when you applied at the foundation for the scholarship, you said my voice was thrilling. The greatest this side of Tepicini. Huh? Well, I couldn't spell mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they expect a father to exaggerate. Oh, Dad. Yes, Emma? Didn't you say you had a class at 3 o'clock? Oh, Lord, where's my hat? Here it is. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. Will you be home for dinner? Uh, yes, and I should like to hear Schubert played as if it meant something. Not like a swing band with discord. <laughs> oh, bye, bye. Bye. You know, I never knew anyone who could get so much fun out of being angry. Girl. <laughs> Girl. Yes, Aunt Etta. That young florist fellow's here again. Ernest? 
I guess that's his name. Come on, girls, clean up the room. Let him in, Aunt Etta. All right. Well, when Ernest the Florist shows up, it needs more free posies for Emma. What is this power you have over Floris, Emma? Oh, Thea, I wish you'd stop harping on that. You know very well Ernest is just a friend of the family. He doesn't come here to see me. Mm-hmm. Well, out of four sisters, there's got to be one liar. Go right <laughs> in, Ernest. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I, uh... Well, hello, Ernest. Hello, hello Ernest. Hello. <laughs> oh, hello. What is it today, Ernest? More flowers? Yes, it's, uh, they're orchids. Orchids? Orchids. Emma, did you hear that? Why, Ernest, you shouldn't do that. Oh, well, I, I didn't. I mean, they're not for you, Emma. They're for Thea. And, for well, me? Uh, yes, I'm just delivering them, so, well, there's a card inside that... Thea, who are they from? Here's the card. Mr. Benjamin Crowley. Oh, there's something on the back. Listen, I hope you'll wear these tonight. Thea, who is he? How did you meet him? What's he like, Thea? Wait, I met him last week. He's the handsomest... The handsomest? Well, make it the most distinguished. Is he young? Mm, young enough. I think I'll just... Rich? Strictly Surtex. What's his name again? Benjamin Crowley. No middle name? Well, he can't be so very rich. He asked me to the country club last night, and I accepted. Oh, you didn't? I did, but he's coming here for dinner first. For dinner? Oh. Well, I guess I'd better be getting on. That is if, uh... Oh, Ernest, are you leaving? Well, I thought seeing I've delivered the flowers, and... Well, so long, Emma. I'll drop in again sometime, maybe when... So long. So long. <laughs> oh, poor Ernest. Emma, you really ought to pay some attention to him. If ever someday he finishes a sentence, I'll marry him. Oh, dear. We're trying to wish a bow on Emma, and now Thea has a real one. Everything has been so beautiful. I want things to go on just the way they are, always. I don't want anything to change it at all, ever. Oh, oh, don't be silly. Can you imagine anything worse than a house full of old maids? Oh, say, if I'm going out tonight, I'll have to borrow your wrap, Anne. Do you mind? All right. And, Kay, do you have a pair of stockings? I've got one good stocking. I've got another. That'll make a pair. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? Every time a limp beauty goes out, the rest of the household automatically becomes a nudist colony. <laughs> <laughs> Say, is Mr. Ben Crowley worthy of all this fuss? Sure he is. He's got money, and I want money, lots of it. Well, nobody said a word about love yet, Thea. Oh, love's overrated, old-fashioned, last generation. Don't tell me that you... Why, Emma? Yep. I want love, storybook style, with all the trimmings. A knight in shining armor on a white horse. Fantastic. Yeah, of course it is. Where you're going to find a white horse these days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Anne, tell him I'm right. About love, I mean. Well, I don't think you are. I wouldn't mind mothering someone, a kitten or a puppy or a baby. But I want fun, lots of laughs. And the married people I've seen, well, they seem a little short on laughter. Well, I don't care. I'll take a chance. And, Anne, you're going to like Ben. I doubt it. Anne! Well, I don't want to like him. He's got no right to come courting you. I don't want to see this family broken up. Oh, why meet trouble halfway, Anne? He hasn't proposed to Thea yet. <laughs> Is everything going all right, Annetta? Now, don't worry, Thea. It'll be a dinner you'll be proud of. All this fuss for Ben Crowley. Never mind, Anne. You just take care of cooking the ducks. That's your department. How's it coming? Well, the last time I looked, they were okay. But if you don't stop getting excited, you're going to look as if you really did cook this dinner. Oh, that reminds me. Have you got your speech straight, Anne? Well, listen to this. Oh, Mr. Crowley, I just can't get over it. Thea cooked the whole dinner, every inch of it herself, and just look at her. She's as fresh and beautiful as if she just stepped out of a bandbox. Oh, that's fine, Anne. Well, I've been rehearsing it for an hour. Oh, there he is. And go out and introduce everybody. Well, I don't even know him. Well, introduce yourself. Tell him I'm busy in the kitchen. I'll be right there. All right, all right. Take it easy. Aunt Etta, I'm scared. Now, don't be silly, I tell you. Everything is going to be fine. Do I look all right? I think you look wonderful. Now, go on. It's late enough for you to make an entrance. All right. I... Oh, dear. Hello, Ben. Oh, hello, Thea. You've met everybody, I see. I certainly have. I, I was just saying to Mr. Lamp... You're a, a rosebud garden of girls. Oh, Mr. Crowley. Oh, I mean it. Well, I imagine dinner's ready. Uh, let's sit down, shall we? All right. Oh, right there, Mr. Crowley. Oh, thanks. Certainly is nice to sit down to a home-cooked dinner. <laughs> oh, Anne. Uh, yes, Thea? Anne, uh, you were going to, uh, well, I thought Oh, oh, that... oh yes. <clears throat> oh, Mr. Crowley, I just can't get over it. Thea cooked the whole dinner, every inch of it herself, and just look at her. She's as fresh and beautiful as if she just stepped out of a bandbox. Yeah, yeah, she is, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. <clears throat> well, uh, let's start. Girls, girls. Is dinner ready, Aunt Etta? We might as well to face the situation, girls. Anne forgot to light the oven under the dock. What? Oh, oh you oh, mean... Don't, you, don't forget she cooked the dinner. Anyway, Thea, 
what I wanted to say is... Yes, Ben? Well, Thea, the fellows at the Boosters Club think I've... Well, I have a pretty good future in this town. Of course, Ben, go on. And if, if I'm going to have a future, well, a man ought to look ahead into the future, so to speak. Oh, yes, Ben? Well, Thea, what I meant is... I, I'd like to share that future with you. With me? Yes. Oh, Ben... Are you asleep, Emma? I would have been. Oh, what do you want, Em? Emma, do you think Thea really loves Ben? Well, she's going to marry him, isn't she? I mean, do you think she loves him as much as she loves us? Well, it's... It's a different kind of love, Anne. I should think it is. You certainly can't compare what you feel for someone you hardly know and what you feel for your own family that you were born into and have lived with all your life. Well, sometimes it's more. You mean to say a stranger could come in here and mean more to me than father and Aunt Etta? My own sisters more than you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you're certainly not very worldly wise. Oh. <laughs> oh, Emma, don't let's get married ever. Let Thea and Kay if they want to, but not us. We'll grow old together, beautifully and gracefully. Wait and see. We'll both look just like Whistler's mother. Yes, but if we don't get married, how are we going to look like anybody's mother? <laughs> You'll feel differently one day, Anne. You're a lot younger than I am. A couple of years. What's that? Emma, there isn't anyone. I mean, you haven't met anyone. Of course not. I mean, you and Ernest. <laughs> Does Ernest look like a knight in shining armor? No. As long as he's the only man on the horizon, I guess I'm headed for the shelf. The Limp family is going to have one old maid. Two. And we'll have a cat. Mm-hmm. A tortoise-shelled one. And we'll call her, let me think, Bathsheba, uh-uh. Mahedible... No, Topaz, because you have the most beautiful yellow eyes and the hey, longest, hey, most... Hey, hey, wait a minute. Don't make her too beautiful. We want her to be an old maid, too. <laughs> there it goes again. Did you hear that, Annetta? What did you say, Anne? That squeak, it's driving me crazy. Must be your violin. Your father says you're not very good. It isn't my violin. Listen, there it is. Seems to be outdoors. Why, it's someone swinging on our gate. Swinging on our gate? It's a man. Well, for heaven's sake, go out and tell him to stop. Well, you can bet I will. Hey, hey, get off that gate, will you? Oh, hello. Is this your gate? I have an interest in it, yes. It isn't much good for swinging. You know that, don't you? I've swung on it for 18 years. It's done all right by me. Evidently, my standards are much higher. The fault lies with you, not with the gate. With me? Sure. No leverage. That's your trouble. Mind if I show you? Well, after all, it's your gate. Now watch. There. You see? A little pressure on the ball of the foot. Weight evenly distributed. And there you are. Say, that's pretty good. Mind if I swing with you? It's okay with me, but stay on your own side. Thanks. <laughs> you know, this is the third or fourth happiest day of my life. You're new around here, aren't you? Yes. My name's Felix. Felix Dietz. D-E-I-T-Z. I'm an old friend of the Lamp family. What? An old friend? Oh, slight exaggeration. My father was a very good friend of old Mr. Lamp's. I'm his daughter, and he's not so very old. Well, Miss... Uh... Anne. Anne, the gate swinger. Well, Anne... In this pocket, I have a letter to your father. In fact, he's quite young looking. Granted, but what's Right that? now, he's at the Music Foundation. He works there. He's the dean of the faculty. One of the youngest looking deans I've ever had. Good. In this other pocket, I have another letter to the president of the foundation. Could you possibly direct me? Why, to... certainly. You go down Briar Road and turn. Four blocks on Cliff Street and turn. Straight ahead, three blocks, and then... And then you... I turn. Thanks. I'll find it, I'm sure. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, uh, by the way, one more question. What are you having for dinner tonight? Lamb chops. Lamb chops. Mm, That'll do very nicely. Nobody invited you to dinner. Your father will. I'll see to that. Au revoir. So long. I'll see you at dinner. Some nerve. Take my advice, Anne. Don't set that extra place. He won't be here. I've seen him. He'll be here, Emma. He can swing on a gate. He's got letters to Dad and the Dean, and he tolerates lamb chops. Well, that doesn't mean he'll be invited to dinner, Anne. 
He'll not only be here for dinner, but he'll tell us where to sit. He'll say grace, do the carving, make all the conversation, and help himself to a second portion of dessert. That's my impression of Mr. Deeks. And my impression of your impression is that he sells vacuum cleaners or something or other. Well, whatever he's selling, you'll buy it. Come in, young fellow. Thanks. Well, nice place, Mr. Lamp. Who's that? That girl's is Mr. Dietz, D-E-I-T-Z. Yeah, this way, young man. Well, 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 quite a crowd of daughters. Hello, Dietz. Hello, Lamp. <clears throat> My dad, won't you introduce her? Oh, certainly. Girls, uh, this is Felix Dietz. He's a blasted young pup who prefers jazz to the classics. He's arrogant, disrespectful, argumentative, conceited, and I like it. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot to mention that I have no talent whatsoever. You've been telling me that all the way home. Oh, they can tell that by just looking at you. <laughs> well, I'm Thea, and you look talented to me, whatever you do. Thank you. I compose. I'm Kay. What do you compose? Trash. Uh, modern tone poems, I call them, Miss Kay. How nice. I'm Emma, positively the last sister. <laughs> Go ahead. Produce more. I'm not the least bit tired. Well, come on, come on. Dinner's ready. Well, I thought you said there weren't any more sisters. Who's this? Uh, this is Felix Dietz, uh, the son of my old friend. Oh, this is Aunt Etta. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. You know, I'm going to sit right next to you at dinner, and we're going to hold hands under the table. Strange how I cotton to you. You know, girls, he's the nicest thing that's come into this house since the electric percolator. <laughs> I imagine we'll be seeing him often. Uh, you know the president of the foundation, don't you? Hard-boiled, isn't he? Pure granite. Well, it took this man just seven minutes to talk him into giving him a job at the foundation. Uh, ten minutes. I timed it. Well, that means you're going to live in Briarcliff, doesn't it, Mr. Dietz? That's right. Hooray! Oh, Mr. Dietz, we want you to feel free to come and swing on our gate any time you like. Emotion chokes me. Oh, by the way, where are you going to live? Oh, I haven't thought about that yet. Well, there's a small hotel in town. Small and mangy. A couple of nice rooming houses, though. With gates. Uh, say, I've got it. Why don't you stay here? Uh, here? Oh, Mr. Lemp, it's awfully nice of you, but, well, moving in on your family will... Would tomorrow be too soon? Well, girls, what did I tell you? Oh, oh, really, girls, I can't get over it. A few hours ago, we never heard of a young man named Felix Dietz, and now he's practically a fixture in this house. I thought I'd choke when Dad asked him to stay with us. Did you see Aunt Etta's face light up, though? She's fallen for him completely. Why, she's downstairs now, rearranging the living room furniture to suit Felix's taste. Well, if you ask me, life and laughter's finally come to the limps. I think Dad asked him to stay because he wants someone around to argue music with. <laughs> well, okay, maybe Dad figured we could use the room and board money. Did you ever stop to think of that? You know, Felix may not be such a nuisance after all. What do you say, Anne? I say that if Felix Deep demanded a hundred a month to live here, you girls would move heaven and earth to scrape it together. What? And furthermore, at the very thought of his being in this house, your collective heart thumping is causing enough vibration to crumble the walls of Jericho. Nuisance, indeed. You're falling in love with him, all of you. <laughs> oh, oh, Anne. Well, what about you, Anne? I suppose you're immune to the Deep's charm. <laughs> I can laugh at all of you. Remember me, Annie, the sister who never got her man or wanted him. Oh. <laughs> During this brief intermission, before Mr. DeMille brings us Act Two of Four Daughters with our all-star cast, let's go on our magic carpet across country to Tennessee, to the pleasant home of Mrs. S.C. Silver in Nashville. She has a 13-year-old grandson, Frank, and here he comes now. Hi, Grandma. Oh, Frank, look at your feet. You're all wet and muddy. Well, gee, Granny, I, I sort of slipped in a puddle. Oh, dear, they should have known that white socks aren't practical for a, a jackanapes like you. You'd never know they were ever white. Just look how muddy they are. And good heavens, they're all stained from your shoes. Ah, oh, shucks, you can get them clean all right, can't you? Well, they're so awfully dirty, I'm afraid not. Oh, gee, Granny, please, you gotta, it's important. We're having something special in the gym tomorrow. Well, I'll see what can be done. Well, you know, I got out the Lux Flakes and made some extra rich suds and washed the socks thoroughly in them. And you should have seen the water. It was filthy. But when I finished, the socks were white as snow. And next morning when I gave them to Frank, he said... Gee, that... Granny, they're slick. 
They look like you bought me a new pair. Just like a boy. Well, that scene, ladies and gentlemen, was based on a letter Mrs. Silver wrote us. Those socks were a tough problem, but Lux scored again. Lux flakes not only do the difficult and unusual tasks well, they do your everyday tasks, like stockings and underthings, house dresses and sweaters, and all washables, thoroughly and safely, too. That's what Mrs. Silver found, and that's what you'll find, too. Lux suds are so rich and active, they simply float out the dirt and leave your things bright and fresh-looking. There's no harmful alkali, no cake soap rubbing, to fade or streak washable colors or hurt sensitive fibers. Use Lux for all your woolens, everything safe in water alone. And, of course, for your pretty house dresses and printed silks, stockings and underthings. Be sure to buy the thrifty large size box of Lux Flakes. The fine sheer flakes are so pure, a little Lux goes a long way. Now our producer, Mr. DeMille. The curtain goes up on Act Two of Four Daughters, starring John Garfield as Mickey, Jeffrey Lynn as Felix, Priscilla Lane as Anne, Rosemary Lane as Emma, Lola Lane as Thea, and Leota Lane as Kay. A few weeks have gone by since Felix made his entrance into the Lemp household. In the room shared by Anne and Emma, there is silence, broken only by the scratch of two pens as the girls write busily in their diaries. It's bedtime. Anne frowns deeply as she begins a new sentence. Quiet evening at home. That's because Felix has gone to New York for a few days. But he'll be back soon to take up his position as president, king, and prime minister of the household. I'll tell you a secret, Diary. I like him very much. On the other side of the room, Emma (laughs) smiles quietly as she reads over what she has written. He's been here only a few weeks, and everything seems different somehow. Isn't it strange that a knight in shining armor should be called Felix? You know, Felix, I don't mind you wasting your time, but please don't waste it on my piano. Quiet, Mr. Lamp. This is my own composition. You wrote that thing? Why? Ever hear of the Manhattan Academy of Music? They've announced a competition for native-born composers. That's me. And first prize is $1,000. We'll use it to buy you a new piano. Oh, so you're going to win first prize, are you? With that collection of catcalls? Oh, come on, come on. You've got a class to teach at three. There's still half an hour. I'm waiting for Mickey Borden. Who's he? He's an arranger I picked up. He's going to help me orchestrate my composition. It's criminal, wasting another person's time. Oh, it isn't exactly a waste of time. Mickey's out of a job right now. Well, you tell him for me that orchestrating this thing is one step lower than being out of work. Will he be here soon? He's an hour late now, but he might not get here at all. He might not get here next by next week or... Well, it was my impression that only trombone players oh, drank. Oh, Mickey doesn't drink. He's just a little, well, unpredictable. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. No completely sane person could do a good job on that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll see you at the foundation. Now, don't be too late now. Okay. I'll see who it is, Aunt Etta. Hi. Hello, Mickey. Come on in. Right in that way, Mickey. I've just been working on the Rhapsody. Hmm, a rug on the floor, a piano, and the smell of cooking from the kitchen. It's homes like these that are the backbone of the nation. Where's the spinning wheel? Shut up. Did you miss the train? I ignored the train. Thumbed my way up. Why? I gave you more than enough for the fare. Well, I bet the five dollars on a horse I could have bought for seven. He had a lovely name, Felix, that I can't for the life of me remember. Well, this time of day, there's plenty of traffic from town. You shouldn't have been this late. Oh, I had lots of offers from small fry, trucks and station wagons, but I held out for a town car. Poor man's privilege. <laughs> Look, Mickey, I've got to run over to the foundation. Suppose you take a room in this town for a few weeks till we're through. Save you a lot of traveling. It's all right with me. I was evicted this morning. I'm going to miss those cobwebs. Now, here's the first movement. Look it over, will you? I'll be back in an hour, and we'll get you a room. Okay, just so it's on the other side of the railroad tracks. I can't breathe this clean air. Oh, uh, there's a woman in the kitchen. Introduce yourself to her. Name's Aunt Etta. I know the type. <laughs> okay, see you later, Mick. Uh-huh. Well, I 
kind of thought it didn't sound like Felix explaining. Who are you, young man? Is that important? Well, for all I know, you may be a burglar with designs on the piano. According to Felix, I'm supposed to introduce myself. Mickey Borden. I guess your aunt, uh, something or other. Etta. Etta, yep. Name fits right in. What type aunt are you? The gruff voice hiding the soft heart? Are you the sweet, simple land, sakes alive, I smell something burning at? Or the... Felix should have prepared me for you. How about a cup of tea? Sure. Can I throw in a couple of cakes? How'd you know I hadn't eaten since yesterday morning? I'm the nearsighted, but you can't hide a thing from me type of aunt. I see. Well, you needn't look so noble about it. Tea is only a little hot water. Well, I'll get the kettle going. I'll tell you what I think of you later. Hello. Oh, Anne. Home early, aren't you? Uh-huh. Who's, who's that? Oh, this is Mickey, er... Uh, Borden. Borden. He's a friend of Felix, I think. Oh, how do you do? We just know each other. I'm orchestrating his rhapsody. I'm making some tea for Mr. Borden. Just a little hot water. You want some, Anne? Oh, please, Aunt Edda. It's that, Anne. You're in for something. What do you mean? You'll see. <laughs> Got a cigarette? Sure. Cork tip, no less. Here you are. Light it for me, will you? What? Oh, all right. Here, Mr. Borden. Okay. Say, is that part of Felix's composition? No. This is something of my own. Why, it's beautiful. It stinks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, you're probably right. Just making conversation. All the same, I hope you're not entering that in the competition. Around these parts, we want Felix to win. Can't enter it if I wanted to. It's only got a middle. Only got a... You mean you only wrote a middle? No beginning, no end? Just the middle. Well, do you think it's right to leave a song dangling in midair with no face or feet? Why not? Well, for one thing, a full-bodied composition might easily win first prize. I wouldn't win first prize if I were the only entry in the contest. Well, it seems to me that mathematically, you'd stand a fine chance. Do you think they'd let me win, those guys up there? Up where? Who? They. The fates, the destinies. Whoever they are that decide what we do or don't get. Oh. They've been at me now for 28 years. No let up. First they said, let him do without parents. He'll get along. Then they decided he doesn't need no education. That's for sissies. And right at the beginning, they tossed the coin. Heads he's poor, tails he's rich. So they tossed the coin with two heads. Then for the finale, they got together on talent. Sure, they said, let him have talent. Not enough, of course, to let him do anything on his own, anything good or great. Just enough to let him help other people. It's all he deserves. Well, you put all this together and you got Michael Bolgar. Bolgar? Well, that's the name I was born with. I thought if I change it, I'd throw him off the trail. Didn't work. <laughs> well, of course, you know you're very silly. Who asked you to listen? Well, you're insulting a person who believes that a man decides his own destiny. That is, if a man has enough ambition and enough courage... <laughs> well, I guess I deserve that. Still, I know enough about music to tell you that if you finished your composition, you... I tell you, they won't stand for my winning. They're sitting up there, working overtime against me. What some people will do for time and a half. <laughs> we won't talk about it anymore. I can see it's a painful subject to you. Oh, it's my favorite subject. Talking about my tough luck is the only fun I get. Ed, 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 help! <laughs> Wait a minute. Were you smiling just now? I think so, yeah. I wish you'd do something for me. Why? Throw your head back and laugh uproariously. Why? No reason, just laugh. <laughs> uh-huh, just as I thought. You don't know the first thing about laughter. I see the sort I'm up against, the gay young thing type, unimportant species. Well, it isn't the quality of your laughter I'm complaining about. It's your attitude. Attitude? When I asked you to laugh, you wanted to know why you should. As if a person has to have a reason to laugh. They might have a reason not to. And someday I'll give you a little talk on the difference between a laugh and a giggle. Oh, my goodness. Ed, Ed, uh, help, help! Hello. Oh, good morning. You look very domestic. Baking a cake. It'll probably fall. That's fate, destiny. Say... I thought you were supposed to be working on Felix's composition. I am. I'm just taking off a little time to practice my laughing. <laughs> well, come to think of it, you've improved a lot for just one week. Thanks. Say, were you sneaking around my room yesterday when I was out? How'd you guess? Tried not to leave fingerprints. The minute my back's turned, you put curtains up on me. And that isn't all. 
The next time you're out, I'm going to slip a couple of flower pots on your sill. You just try it. My landlady's got orders to shoot you on sight. And when I get through with your room, I'm going to work on you. Look at yourself. What's wrong with me? Your hair's always reaching for the ceiling. Your tie's at half mashed. Your... And there's something about the state of New York that I think you ought to know. Huh? What? In the state of New York, a crease in the pants is strictly constitutional. What do you say, Mickey? Uh, I'll think about it. Swell. And now, just one more thing. Yeah? In between times, when you're not practicing how to giggle, what about doing a little work on your own composition? Ah, uh, shut up. Well, think what a kick in the pants it would be to those destinies of yours if you ran off with the first prize. What if I do win? Oh, here it comes again. My picture in the magazines, a new suit, hullabaloo. Then one morning, I'm walking down the street when a bolt of lightning with my number on it and nothing else to do follows me around the corner and bops. Oh, Mickey. Yep, that's the way I'm leaving this world. Lightning. I'll lay odds. Somewhere, Mickey, there's a straight jacket with your number on it, just waiting. Oh, what time is it? It's early. I promised to meet Felix at the train. Aunt Edda, will you finish this cake? I knew it. All right. Thanks. I've got to rush, Mickey. I promised I'd walk Felix home from the station. Why the excitement? He's only been away a day. But I promised that's important. I made a promise, too. To myself. What? Come here, Anne. Mickey. Mickey, please. I... I don't want you to think that that kiss was a spur-of-the-moment stuff. I planned it for a week. It's pretty mild for a week's thought. Just a friendly kiss. We're going to be great friends, aren't we? Yeah, I'll work at it. In fact, we're going to be such great friends that we won't have to give each other anything for Christmas. How's that? Yeah, that's great. I like that. I'm sorry, Mickey. Well, I've got to go now. Goodbye for a while. So long. Home again. Ah, it's great to be home. The old town hasn't changed a bit. Say, listen. When I promised to walk home with you, I didn't think it was going to develop into a foot race. Slow down. Oh, sorry, Ann. Well, that's better. Do you know, Ann, that your eyes are very beautiful? Why, Mr. Deeds. They are. Know something else? I love you. Why? What? I said I love you. Excuse me, I didn't... What did you say, Felix? I said I love you. I won't say it again. Oh, well, thanks. Since when? Since the moment I first saw you. You can't be original when you're in love. Oh. Well? Well, what? That was in the nature of a proposal. I expect something in the nature of an answer. Well, of course I adore you, Felix. That's a good start. But couldn't we go on just this way, you know? Lots of laughs. Well, we could be married and still go on laughing. There have been cases. I love you, Anne. I can't swing on a gate and I don't know much about anything else. But I'll try to make you happy. You're this crazy world to me, Anne. And the insane world before this and the mad world to come. I... Oh, Felix. What? Let's hurry, shall we, darling? Hurry? I... I want to tell the family right away. You want to... You mean... Well, come on! Here, these flowers go over there. Ben, help me, will you? Sure thing. Oh, Thea, aren't you excited? Excited? You'd think it was my wedding day instead of Anne. Weren't you excited at our wedding, Thea? Of course, darling. I did it all over. Emma, where's Emma? Here. Emma, did you arrange about the wedding cake? Yes, it's on its way over. I, I'd better speak to Aunt Edna about it. Kay, what's the matter with Emma? I don't know. Oh, I guess she's got the weeps. <laughs> I've kind of got them myself. <laughs> Emma, <laughs> Emma, don't, darling. They hear you. I can't help it, Aunt Edna. I know it's wrong, but I love Felix. Now he's... Oh, hush now. Shh. Someone else will come along. No, no. Of course he will. In about six months. That's the usual time. Don't contradict me, Emma. I know all the ways a bear of men being a spinster. Etta, where's Anne? Have you seen her? Yes, I did. And don't get so excited. Well, where is she? She went out for a walk with Mickey. A walk on our wedding day? Well, why not? Lots of girls get the fidgets on their wedding day. Walk will probably do her good. Please, Mickey, don't just sit there and stare. Listen to me, please. Why must you look so beautiful? 
Oh, Mickey. You're getting married in an hour. Another dream shot. That isn't tough enough. But you've got to look like a convention of angels. Listen to me, Mickey. You always said it was my fault. I never put up a battle. All right. I'm full of fight now. I love you, Anne. Nobody else can have you. I love you. Mickey, come to your senses. You see, Anne, your theory's all cockeyed. There's no use fighting. I accept the verdict. What's more, I'll attend the wedding. I'll stand in the corner and my smile will be just as brave as Emma's. Emma? Well, why should Emma? Why should Emma? You mean to say you don't know Emma's insane about Felix? Emma? Felix? Mickey, you're out of your mind. Huh? Well, I guess when you're used to standing on the outside looking in, you can see things others can't. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Poor Emma. That night when you told everybody, I was watching. She went white as a sheet, ran out of the room. No. When she came back, her eyes were red from crying. That, that made me feel very close to Emma. But it wasn't that. It couldn't have been. It was because of me. Because I was getting married. Oh, don't you see? We've always been so close. No, I don't believe it, Mickey. You're only saying it to frighten me. All right. Go home. Get married. But it isn't true. You were lying, weren't you? Yes. That's as good a name for it as any. No. You weren't lying. You weren't. Oh, Mickey, what can I do? <laughs> Emma. Yes, Felix? Oh, Emma, will you do me a favor? Will you tie this tie for me? Oh, of course. Better stand still. Oh, I can't do a thing with it. I, I'm a nervous wreck, I tell you. My fingers have turned to jelly. Feel. They're cold. So are yours. What are you nervous about? I? I'm not nervous. Hey, it's a quarter after three. I'm ready. Emma, is Anne in our room? Why, I don't know. Well, I'm sure I don't. I'll go look, Dad. Who was that at the door, Aunt Etta? Here. It's a telegram. Telegram, Felix? No, it's not for Felix. It's for you, Emma. For me? Excuse me. Well, I thought only brides got wires on wedding days. Who's it from, Emma? Oh. Oh, no. What's wrong? Emma, what's happened? It's... It's for man. She's married Mickey Borden. Married? Emma, what does it say? Here, read it. You must break the news to Felix. Make him understand that this is for the best. I found out just in time to avoid making a dreadful mistake. Mickey and I will be married by the time this reaches you. Felix will understand and forgive. Oh, Felix. No, don't. Don't say anything, please. <laughs> In just a moment, Mr. DeMille brings you Act Three of Four Daughters with John Garfield, Jeffrey Lynn, and the Four Lane Sisters. Every now and then, don't you ask yourself what you want most in life? And I think pretty often your answer is happiness. Well, that's really what we all want, Mr. Ruick. Happiness for ourselves and for those we love. Yes, Sally. And it makes me think of something Mrs. Ruick was telling me this morning. She was telling me about a friend of hers, a young bride, who wanted happiness but felt it slipping away from her. You know, Helen, I want Jack to be proud of me more than anything else in the world. Of course. And he is, Jane. I don't know. You see, Helen, he used to be so proud of me. Of my appearance. And everywhere we went, he sort of, well, you know, sort of showed me off and everything. And now, well, I just have the feeling that he isn't quite so proud of me. I have a feeling he thinks I've let him down. Oh, Janie, you can't mean that. Well, I'm a little self-conscious these days, for one thing. Just look at my hands. They used to be so nice, and now they get so rough and red from housework, and especially from dishwashing. I'm ashamed of them. I sort of try to hide them, and it spoils everything for me. And I do so want to help Jack. Poor dear. I know exactly how you feel, but there's really no need for it. Well, what can I do? The, the thing that hurts most is that I know it hurts Jack every time he looks at my hands. 
He feels I'm working too hard, and I'm not, really. Oh, now, Jane, stop your worrying. I know the very thing for you. And Helen, being a woman of action, had Jane stop at the corner grocery store on her way home to get some Lux Flakes, because Lux will help hands stay soft and smooth in spite of dishwashing. That's a mighty good way to help, Jane. Lux is so kind to your hands. But it means so much more than that, don't you think? It means more love and admiration and social success. Every husband wants to be proud of his wife's appearance, and that will make both of them happier. Sally, it's amazing, but true, how a simple thing can have such far-reaching effects. Well, pretty hands are mighty important, Mr. Ruick. And here's a fact that I think is worth repeating. Beauty experts advise Lux Flakes for washing dishes because it's so mild. And it's inexpensive, too. You'll find Lux is so pure, a little goes a long way. Lux is thrifty. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue with Four Daughters. Anne and Mickey were married in September. Now it's just a week before Christmas. And in their tiny New York apartment, Anne sits alone in the shabby living room. She looks tired and drawn, but she's smiling as she reads over a letter from home. I suppose you read in the papers that Felix Composition won the first prize and a contract with the Seattle Symphony. He will be leaving soon, and I don't know when we will see him again. And now, here's our big news. Emma is going to be married to Ernest, the florist. We were all terribly surprised, but she seems quite happy. She would tell you all about it herself. Anne, you can't imagine how we've missed you these months. But now Christmas is a week away, and your father is so looking forward to a family reunion. Please, Anne, please get back for Christmas. Your loving aunt, Etta. Hmm? What? You hate vegetable soup, don't you, darling? No, I kind of like it. Oh, for my sake. Hate it, please. Why? I've just discovered something about myself. I can't make vegetable soup. Well, uh, could you salvage something from the vegetables? A stew or an omelet or something? Well, I must have done something wrong. Those vegetables in the pot, they disappeared. Well, anyway, we can look forward to the Christmas dinner your dad's going to give us. I just read Aunt Etta's letter again. It gets better with each reading. In the meantime, we can run down to Joe's Red Room. We've got just enough left for two of his death-defying dinners and a pair of tickets to Briarcliff. After that, yeah. After that, Social Security will take care of us. Well, I feel old enough to be eligible. Anne, I can't make any money orchestrating. If only there was something else I could do. Nonsense. A little gray at the temples and you'd make a wonderful bank president. Yeah? I bet you'd be glad to get out of this dungeon for a couple of days. Oh, it's not so bad. Only... Did you ask the landlord for hot water? I did, but uh, he countered by asking for the rent. Well, you ask him first. And after all these months, you still love me? Oh, it's only four months. Sure I do. You really do? Get a notary. I'll sign an affidavit. You still love me? You must be crazy. That's a statement that would get you into the most exclusive insane asylum. Well, you wouldn't do so badly with the entrance exams yourself. Yeah, maybe. Do you want to go home for Christmas? Why, yes, Mickey. Don't you? Okay, okay. I, I just wanted to make sure. Why, Mickey? I met a fellow today who was trying to set up a combination for South America. You mean a band? Yeah, yeah. He, he wants me at the piano. It'd only take $300 to get us there. I could raise it someplace, but we'd have to leave right away. Oh, uh, Mickey. Yeah? Now it's my turn to ask you a question. These past four months, have you been happy? I've been closer to it than I've ever been before. Then why do you suddenly want to traipse to South America? Perhaps to give its lightning a chance at me. Only fair. If you weren't married, if you didn't have me, you'd get there somehow, wouldn't you? I guess so. I'm holding you back. That's right, that's right. That's what I told this guy. I said, I can't go. 
I got a wife around my neck who wants to go home for Christmas, and I think more of her than I do of your job. Thanks, darling. That was pretty swell. Nice work, Fear. And you're wonderful. Isn't she wonderful, Adam? Oh, fair, fair. They need to practice together. Oh, On the contrary, I think they're very good. Personally, I thought it was great. You ought to get home more often, Anne. Thanks, Felix. Well, who'll have what's left of the turkey? Ernest? Well, yes, I wouldn't mind it. I guess nobody'd mind. Come on, Emma. You can help. All right. Wait, Aunt Etta. Don't fix anything for me, will you? I've got to leave, you know. Oh, Felix. Sorry, trains don't wait. I'll get your bag, Felix. I'm the youngest. I'll go get his hat and coat. Better get the car out, I guess. Oh, Felix, I do hate to see you go. Please miss your train. Seattle won't believe you're a real musician if you get there on time. <laughs> we'll expect a letter every week now. Full report. I'll send press clippings. Make sure your father reads them. <laughs> oh, <da. laughs> oh, was somebody getting my coat? Here, Felix. Oh, thanks, Anne. It was swell seeing you. It was swell being here. You know, Anne, whoever said out of sight, out of mind was a liar. Shakespeare probably said it. He said everything. Yes. Well, goodbye, Lamp. So long, Deets. Wait a second, will you? Oh, so long, Mickey. Not yet. I'm going to drive you to the station. Okay, thanks. Well, bye, everybody. Bye, Felix. Bye. Bye. So long. All right. Well, there he goes. Come on, if you want some supper. I'll help, Anne. Anne. Yes, Emma? Isn't it grand for all of us to be together again? Seems almost like a dream. So much has happened. Felix a success. Three of us married. (laughs) Well, I almost am. Ernest wants to make it soon. Emma, I've got to know. You and Felix, I, I thought you were in love with him. I was. I guess we all were. Looking back, the day you were going to marry Felix, I thought if the world should end now, it would only be an anticlimax. I know better now. And I really owe it all to you, Anne. To me? You see, if you'd married Felix, I suppose I'd have gone on all my life thinking I'd miss my Prince Charming on his white horse. But when your telegram came, well, everyone just went to pieces. That is, everyone but Ernest. But he was so quiet and so capable and, and so dignified. That started it. It's funny how long you can be around people and not know how much they really mean to you. Now, take you and Mickey. Emma, stop. Anne, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. I'm just... Well, have I said anything that... Anne, you're happy with Mickey. You are, aren't you? Mickey does everything he can to make me happy. He tries very hard. Felix. Yes? I asked Ben to let me drive the car because this is my last chance to tell you that um, I'm sorry I busted things up for you. Oh, ancient history, Mickey. Forget it. Messing things up, that's where I shine. There's one saving grace, though. I usually end up at the bottom of the pile. How have things been going with you, Mickey? No complaints. Been working? After my fashion. Everything all right, then? Head above water. That's good. Do me a favor, Mickey. Huh? (laughs) <laughs> How much do you need? Oh, no. I've been lucky lately. Let me lend you a little something to tide you over. Don't you ever get tired of being such a swell guy? It would bore me stiff. No, thanks, Felix. I, I can't take it. Why not? I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm a new man. The old Mickey would have taken it. The old Mickey was no fool. Well, there's the train. You haven't much time to lose. You got your ticket? Yes, everything. Oh, Mickey. Yeah? Here. Take this, will you? What is it? I told you I didn't need any... Please. It's for Anne. Use it any way you think. That'll make her happy. So long, Mickey. So long. Good luck. (laughs) Good luck. Good luck. What a chance. <laughs> a man decides his own destiny. Someday I'm going to teach you how to land. A bolt of lightning with my number on it. 
That's the way I'm leaving this world. I'll lay odds on it. A man decides his own destiny. Lightning. That's the way. A man decides his own destiny. A man can make his own lightning. His own destiny. His own lightning. His own lightning. His own lightning. Oh, please, doctor. Tell me. Is he very bad? I'm afraid so. It was a bad accident. There's no chance for him. No chance at all. Oh, Mickey. Poor Mickey. You'd better go in now. He only has a few minutes. Mickey. And more of their work. Wouldn't even... Wouldn't even let me go out in style. Don't try to talk, Mickey. You'll be all right. Only lightning can get you. I have your word for it. Sure. But lightning can be manufactured. You know, a man, a man can make his own... Doctor. Doctor, is he... I'm sorry, my dear. There was nothing we could do for him. He's... He's gone, my dear. Oh, Mickey. Mickey. Oh, Mickey. No, no, no. Stop, stop. Terrible, terrible. How you girls, with all the training I've given you, could look so sweet and play so sour. <laughs> for girls who haven't played together for over a year, I think they're doing very well, despite your training. Well, that's enough now. That's enough. Now we'll try it again. Ready, Anne? Stop squeaking. I didn't do that. You certainly did. I heard... Listen, it's our gate. There's a man swinging on our gate. It's Felix. And he wants to see you. Oh, yes, I... I excuse me, Dad. Hello, Lamp. Hello, Dietz. You haven't done right by my gate. Listen to that squeak. I wouldn't swing on a gate that didn't squeak. Why do women hate to use an oil can? Why do men love to smoke smelly pipes? It isn't the pipe. It's the tobacco. And whoever said out of sight, out of mind, is still a liar. Oh, Felix, I'm so glad you're back. I came back for you. For me? Didn't you know I would someday? Oh, I hoped you would. But if you came back for me, then, then what are you doing on that side of the gate? <laughs> oh, Anne. <laughs> 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 In just a moment, our stars return for their curtain calls. But first, I'd like to make a timely suggestion. And, of course, that means a Christmas suggestion. Well, last year, we received quite a lot of nice letters praising our recipe for Lux Snow as a Christmas tree decoration. In fact, I'd like to have you hear one. It's from Mrs. L. H. Hubrexy of Brilliant, Wisconsin. She says, I tried the whipped-up Lux suds you mentioned on the Lux Radio Theater for my Christmas tree, and I was simply delighted with the result. Now listen closely to this, because this is a brand new idea. She goes on to say... I also took branches from a bridal wreath bush and covered them with a Lux mixture. Then I sprinkled shiny artificial Christmas snow over the Lux, placed the twigs in a glass frog also covered with Lux snow, and set it on a mirror flanked by silver candlestick. I used this on my New Year's holiday dining table. <laughs> the result was beautiful, and my guests complimented me on my originality. Now, there's an idea for you. There's lots of ways you can use Lux to make your Christmas more beautiful. For your tree, of course, for your wreaths, and as table decorations. Now, here's the way you make the snow. Get a large box of Lux Flakes. 
pour it into a bowl. Add two scant cups of lukewarm water and beat with an egg beater to the consistency of thick whipped cream. Then take handfuls of the snow and spread with your fingers along the branches of your tree. When you're finished, your tree looks as if it had been out in a snowstorm. It's really beautiful. For extra sparkle, sprinkle shiny artificial Christmas snow over the tree while the suds are still moist. Now, did you get that recipe? You take two scant cups of lukewarm water to a large size box of Lux Flakes and beat to the consistency of thick whipped cream. Be sure to buy the large size box of Lux Flakes. Here is Mr. DeMille with our stars. The traffic problem at our microphone being what it is tonight, I think I'd better make sure that our stars are all here for their curtain call. Garfield? Here. Lynn? Here. Lane sisters, Leota? Here. Rosemary? Present teacher? Lola? Yes, sir. Priscilla? I'll say kid. Oh, don't <laughs> mind Priscilla. <laughs> don't mind her, Mr. DeMille. That was the first thing she ever had to say on the stage, and she's very proud of it. Well, she should be. It's a good line. <laughs> This seems a good time to find out how Mrs. Lane's four daughters got into the business of entertaining the public. Well, I guess it's because we learned to sing when we were all youngsters. You see, we lived in a little town in Iowa where there was a music school, just like the town in Four Daughters, and everybody naturally thought about music. Then Lola and Leota got a job on the stage in New York. Mother was worried about them going to the wicked city alone, but it turned out all right. <laughs> Two weeks later, we got a telegram that said, A sign leads in Greenwich Village Follies. Please send fudge cake. Did you send it? I'll say, kid. <laughs> <laughs> two down and two to go. How about you, Rosemary? When were you and Priscilla called to the footlight? Well, Priscilla and I went to New York to visit Leota, and Fred Waring hired us to sing with his orchestra. And so here we are, four daughters. No, Rosemary, you mean four wives. Our family's growing so fast, we have to consult Warner Brothers ourselves before we know exactly where we are. <laughs> <laughs> At least I know where I am, and four wives, I'm only the ghost of Mickey Borden. A very spirited performance, according to the critics. Well, nobody will miss me with four husbands and four children that go with four daughters now. Oh, we could never forget Mickey Borden. Yeah, what happens between, between you and Jeffrey Lynn and four wives? <laughs> <laughs> you can't expect her to be an old maid. Well, the grapevine says the next picture is four mothers. How'd you like to have first call on uh, four grandmothers, say in about 50 years, Mr. DeMille? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had parts for four daughters right now in a certain picture called Northwest Mounted Police. <laughs> well, the four daughters always get their man. Look at me. <laughs> By the way, what are you ha having here next week, Mr. DeMille? Next Monday night, we celebrate Christmas with one of the most unusual presentations of the entire year, the new Walt Disney production, Pinocchio. Early in the year, Pinocchio will receive its nationwide motion picture release. But next Monday night, you'll have your first opportunity to hear this successor to Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Pinocchio is a lad with a great capacity for getting into trouble. And his classic story has charmed grown-ups and children alike in every country in the world. So next Monday night, the Walt Disney feature Pinocchio will have its premiere at this microphone as our Christmas present to you. Well, that's going to be a swell show, Mr. DeMille. Good night. Good night, Good night. Mr. DeMille. Good night. Don't all try to get through the stage door at once. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Walt Disney's Pinocchio. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying goodnight to you from Hollywood. Heard in tonight's play were Wallace Clark as father, Clara Blandick as Aunt Etta, Hal K. Dawson as Ben, Lou Merrill as Ernest, and Harry Humphreys as Doctor. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. Our Lux Radio Theater production of Four Daughters has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, the tissue-thin soap flakes used by smart housewives everywhere and by the great picture studios here in Hollywood to protect the million-dollar wardrobes you see on the screen. Your announcer has been Melville Roick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>